so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I was carrying a heavy heart last night and I was overwhelmed. I was exhausted. A lot of good things happening, but you ever been there where there's a lot of good things happening, but there's a lot of good things happening and you got all kind of plates spinning and it was Sabbath and my heart had not yet entered into rest. And then I got up this morning and I spent two hours with the Lord. And He poured into my heart. Did He pour into yours this morning? And He has a way of just speaking so precisely to what you're going through. And He re energized me this morning. I had about three people that I reached out to. I said, man, just pray for me. Just pray for me. And man, by about 7 o'clock this morning, before the kids got up, I was like, all right, thank you, Jesus. All right. I'm ready. And then let me tell you, the icing on the cake is when I came here and interacted with many of you. Family, and as we're going to discover later on in this series, church, family, matters, even for the pastor. Listen, family, as you heard in the prayer earlier that was so beautifully given to us, man, I don't know if you guys are sensing this, man, but we are living in the last days. And I don't mean to say that to, sp to spark and induce fear in any heart today but to raise our awareness and hopefully encourage us in faith to trust. Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find Ezekiel faith on the earth? We talked about faith today. Thank you, praise team, worship ministry. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Father, that's what we want to do today. We want to trust you more. We don't want to lean on our own understanding anymore. We're tired of that, Father. We can't do life on our own. We need you, Father. We need you to speak a word right now that will help us as parents, as followers of Jesus. We ask God that right now, you'd so tabernacle with us that you'd show us what parenting looks like from your heart. We need you, Father. Somebody came with a heavy heart. Somebody doesn't know how to parent their children. Somebody doesn't know what to do about a breakup. Somebody doesn't know how the bills are going to get paid. Somebody doesn't even know if they're going to be safe if they leave their house. But God, you are omnipresent. You are with us wherever we go. Whatever we're dealing with, Father, your grace is sufficient. Oh, that we would simply trust you more. God, the beautiful thing is this morning, the beautiful thing is this morning that before we even sang that song, I was singing it this morning on my way. You seem to, Lord, be just confirming that you just want us to trust you more. And I believe as we dive into Genesis 22 today, Father, as we see the relationship between Abraham and Isaac with you, that we will come to understand that you are worthy of our trust because of your character of love. Help us to see Jesus now. We pray for those in Israel. We pray for those in Palestine, those right now in Gaza. Right now, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would dispatch angels right now to intervene. Holy Spirit, subdue proud and, hated and, hate and, and, and hateful hearts. May calm minds prevail. But help us in the midst of all of this, recognize that we are almost home. <laughs> And now is the time to trust you. 
now is the time. We thank you, Lord, in advance for what you are about to do in the worthy and excellent name of Jesus. Let everyone say amen. I had my, my, my young prayer partner just join me a few moments ago, my son Tommy. Speaking of Tommy, my wife and I were tired of going from specialist to specialist, from doctor to doctor, to try and understand what was going on with our son, Tommy. His legs were getting weaker and weaker. And it got to the point where he could no, no longer walk. And we took him to this one particular specialist, this one doctor that was very concerned at what she was seeing, and she said, we need you right now. We need you to take Tommy to the hospital, and what we need you to do is have him do an MRI. We're going to have to put him to sleep. And I tried to prepare my mind, you know, as a parent. You know, you try to prepare your mind for the first time your child gets put to sleep. And the day came, we go into the room where all of the medical professionals are. They're preparing for the MRI, and I bring Tommy in, who are all these strange medical professionals around me. So he starts crying. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm there rocking with him and swaying with him. I'm holding him close. I'm doing this. And as I'm doing that, those that were about to administer the shot to put him to sleep came closer and closer to him. And they gave him the shot, and immediately he fell out in just a few seconds with his mouth slightly open, just like that. And I stood there in shock. As I watched my son's seemingly lifeless body get placed on the machine that was going to bring him in for them to do the MRI. Because nothing prepared me for that moment, my son, my only son, the son in whom I love, was just crying out for daddy in the midst of strangers and then just fell out lifeless, as it were. And nothing could have prepared my heart to experience that when it happened, James. And so one of the medical professionals came and just gently but firmly invited me to leave the room as they begin to do the MRI, and I walk out. And one of them starts walking with me, and they start to talk to me about the procedure, and this is what's happening, and uh, kind of geeking out on whatever he studied in medical school. And I wasn't trying to hear a word he had to say. It was Chinese to me, totally different language. I, I just was not hearing it. And, and, and twice as he's talking, I, I, I say to him, Tim, I say, uh, did, you just, did you just see how my son, he just kind of fell lifeless? I mean, did, did you see that? And Eldar, he, he kind of, it's like his EQ, his, his emotional intelligence, his, his humanity kicked in all of a sudden. And he says, oh, oh, yeah, and then he starts to empathize with me. You see, this experience of mine is just a small, brief window into what the experience and the emotions and the thoughts of Abraham was as he imagined, as it were, the lifeless body of his son Isaac after talking with Yahweh. Yahweh had just said to him, I need you to go to Moriah. If you're familiar with biblical, the biblical landscape, you'll understand that Moriah is in the region that later on would be where Jerusalem is. As a matter of fact, as Abraham is thinking of, oh, we're going to go for a, uh, as he's probably originally hearing the request of God, he says, oh, we need to go to Moriah. Okay, Moriah. Yes, I remember that place. And if Abraham was anything like me, uh, he likes a good long road trip. 50 miles uh, from where Abraham was. Three days is, 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 the, is, is the distance it would have taken him. And so I love a good road trip, especially if you've got the good company of somebody with you, and he's going to have Isaac with him. 
And he's going, yeah, and, and Mariah, Mariah. I remember, I remember going to Mariah, that same region before. Because that's where he met and returned and gave tithe to the priest king, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which would later on in the biblical story be called Jerusalem. But then he hears God say something to him that, that would be the thing that would completely rock his world. He's used to hearing by now the voice of Yahweh. He loves Yahweh. He knows Yahweh. But Yahweh now is asking him to offer his son Isaac as an offering. That's what the pagan gods demand. If they want to be appeased, you offer a sacrifice to somehow win their favor. Yahweh, for now, over 100 years old now, has become now, at this point in his life's journey, accustomed to a God who's different than that. And it's not just that he would lose his son. This is not just a parental feeling of, oh, I'm going to lose my, my, my only son, my firstborn son, whom I love. No, he understands the, the salvific significance of his son. He remembers the promise of Yahweh in Genesis 12, in your seed, all nations of the earth, bearers, shall be blessed. He understands the significance of that. Matter of fact, when God gave him that promise in Genesis 12, it was on the heels of the Tower of Babel when God caused the nations to form different languages and be confused and the nations were now separated because of rebellion against God. And now God is telling him in Genesis 12 that through your seed, Abraham, all nations that were just divided are going to be blessed and united through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way this is going to happen, Abraham, is that you have seed. The only way this is going to happen, Abraham, is if you have a son. And Abraham, I know you don't have one. But God, through his promise, God, through his word, God, through his miraculous power, gave them a son, Isaac, the son of promise. And he understands that for that promise to be fulfilled, and God has shown himself faithful so far, Paris, that his son needs to live on. So what, what is this request coming from God? I love the quote coming from pastor and author Ty Gibson, capturing this idea of the son of promise, the son of the covenant, the, the firstborn son. And here's what he says, Ty Gibson, in a book I highly recommend, The Sonship of Christ. He says, the firstborn son is the channel through which the covenant promises to be passed on from generation to generation. But in a narrative twist that emphasizes, listen, the spiritual nature of the plan, we soon see that the genetic firstborn isn't always the covenant firstborn. Isaac is the secondborn son of Abraham after Ishmael, but Isaac is the firstborn son of promise. This is not just, I'm going to lose my son. There is global, salvific, covenantal implications of whatever happens to my son. And Abraham understood that. And so what is this, God, some kind of sick joke? Come on, talk to me, family. What would you do? Hmm? Think of your children, parents. What would you do if the God that you've come to know, your sustainer, your provider, the one who gave you grace, the merciful, compassionate Savior, the one who is with you, what if he asked you to give up that which you love? Not that which you can discard with, 
You can't discard a child. What is there for us to learn from this experience if you have your Bibles in Genesis 22? What is there for us to learn from this experience with Abraham and Isaac? What could God possibly be trying to teach us as parents through the experience of this journey with Abraham and Isaac by a request that seems so cruel? Well, as always, uh, if you have an ear to hear, and you've come with a heart ready to receive from the Holy Spirit, I believe he'll help us find an answer, yes? And at this point, I hope the pastor gave you enough time to go to Genesis 22. Did he give you enough time? Yes, yes. All right, Genesis 22, beginning in verse number three. Here's what the word of God says. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, everyone say third day. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back to you. And we will come back to you. Listen, come on, talk to me, family. We've got to be transparent. This is a safe place for us to be honest. Amen? You think Abraham just got up, faithful Abraham, loves the Lord, got up that morning early and said, I'm just going to trust the Lord till I die, like we just sang. And he said, I'm going to go and carry out this order. Do you think it just happened that easily? Listen, Abraham is a human being. Do you think Abraham got much sleep the night before? I can't imagine him getting much sleep. I would have probably got maybe two hours tops because I just passed out from maybe crying and pulling out whatever hair I got left on my head. <laughs> he gets up early, I believe, for another reason, family. <laughs> He's got Sarah. <laughs> Come on now, he probably had to get up early to beat her from getting up because had she known what he was getting ready to do, he wouldn't have made about four feet on the journey. Huh? <laughs> ah. But let me tell you something about Abraham. Abraham has been on a journey with God. You know, before I even mention some more about that, you know, he, he, he was, did you notice he, he was to go on a, in a, a three-day journey. I told you, 50 miles to the region of Moriah. And did you notice it's the third day? Is that already triggering some people now, biblically? Something coming to your mind? You see, this is the book of Genesis. This is the book of beginnings. There is an unfolding story that's developing, and there are themes that get repeated over and over and over again intentionally by the Holy Spirit. Why, it's rushing your mind to the third day of Christ's resurrection. How do you make that connection, Pastor? Well, what's the pattern that's there in the Scripture is that the third day often represents a decisive moment in salvation history where you are being tested whether you're going to trust Yahweh or not. A decisive moment. And the decisive moment is the third day in 31 AD. And Christ Messiah from Nazareth himself rose from the dead. But we already know, as people that may be familiar with scripture here, there's something bigger going on here than just what we're seeing on the surface. And notice that he's going to worship. Something you need to know about Abraham and many in the biblical story up until this point, that worship always, please listen, please, please hear this, worship always centered around 
sacrifice. Sacrifice. That was the center of worship. You, Abraham at this point has been on a journey with God. Uh, his servants and, and particularly, listen parents, Isaac, are used to at this point Abraham calling them, listen, calling the family, calling the household, calling his servants together to worship. And they all knew that at the heart of worshiping Yahweh was sacrifice. Sacrifice. They are used to the other pagan gods, as I said earlier, demanding sacrifice, but there just seems to be something different about Yahweh and when worship happens and you offer sacrifice to him, it seems to be different somehow. And so it wouldn't come as any surprise to these two young men that are there with him that he would invite them to worship. It's what he's been doing, and it's what he's been doing particularly intentionally for Isaac. Isaac needed to witness him worship. Listen, Isaac needed to join him in worship. Why? Ah, parents, because the first thing that we're discovering here is that if we are going to disciple our children into followers of Jesus, when we then need to worship with them. I'm going to say it again. The first thing we're discovering here as parents is we disciple our children into followers of Jesus when we worship with them. I don't know if your story is a little bit like mine, but when I was growing up in my household, originally my mother and my father, my biological father was present, but then later it would be my stepfather. And I'll remember growing up that they often would invite us to worship with them, particularly as the sun set on Friday night. As a matter of fact, what that looked like in our house, Reynard, is that mom or my stepfather would start on the piano playing the piano. And when they started singing those songs on the piano, right, Tommy? When they started playing on the piano, it was an indication that the family was to come together for what? Yes. <laughs> for worship. Say worship. 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 Okay. And when the family was called together for Can worship, you huh? You want me to pick you up? You are heavy, my son. You are heavy. You see yourself? Yeah. And when we worshiped, the kids had something to do. Yes? Thank you. Can you go with him? It's true? <laughs> Come on now. Let's go this way. Let's go this way. Can you go this way? Can we go with that? Can we go with mommy? Yeah, where's mommy? Where's mommy? I'll see you in a little bit, Tommy. And I'm, just for those of you that are here and, and, may, um, and may be wondering, just so you know, my son is a gift to our household. And not only is he a gift to our household, my son, uh, as this is a safe place for anyone that is neurodivergent, uh, my, my son falls under that category. And so he's rocking his neurodivergence. Yes? Come on, don't hate, man. You can't be like Tommy. I mean, there's just one Tommy. All right? I mean, there's just one. So... We each had a role to play. We sang songs, you know. Uh, I mean, I don't know, l l l l nod with me or something if you, if you feel this. Sometimes, the, sometimes the, the devotional thought from mom or dad, particularly dad, um, would, would go, if you're watching, sorry, uh, would go too long. Sometimes the prayer would be a little too long. Sometimes me and my brother, one of us are falling asleep during the prayer. We're like, oh, sorry, Jesus. <laughs> And my wife, Deidre, she's like, look, man, that's nothing on my, my, my sister and I, Georgianne, as they were growing up in their household. And, 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 man, listen, on Sunday morning, you had worship all day on Saturday, but on Sunday morning at 6 a.m. after breakfast, you had up to two hours of worship. <laughs> right? Mercy. All right. All right, but, but listen, even as they were uh, tweaking it, Zedna, along the way to make it more relevant for us as children, yes? Especially so none of us fall asleep, huh? 
One of the things that edged itself in my mind as I was growing up is that whenever my parents brought us together for worship, there was a sense that the presence of God was in the house with us as we worshiped together. As they, as, as they tweaked it, right? As they grew. I just knew when we came together, and now that I'm parenting now, you see this? We worship with our kids morning and evening, and on Sabbath, when we bring in the Sabbath together, usually before they go to bed, we have a little story time and a little song. We try not to go too long. I learned something along the way. Auntie Ellen makes a similar comment, so she's with me on this one. And it was about 15 minutes tops, you know. And we sing a song, we do a story, and we're still growing and learning how to do this thing better, and sometimes we're just tired. Can we keep it real? And we just do a prayer. But I want my children to have the same sense of the presence of God that I had even with my parents doing it the best they knew how. Listen, did Abraham get to this place of worshiping regularly with his family and this walk with God by faith overnight? This was a journey of Abraham making mistakes along the way, parents. You saw the situation with Hagar. You saw the situation of lying when it came to Sarah, when he was there with Abimelech. Come on now. God's been on a journey taking Abraham from step to step to step as long as he, listen, stayed in the relationship. Some of us here need to be encouraged. You just need to stay in the relationship. Don't give up. I feel like I'm not there yet. That's what we do sometimes when we read these Bible stories and we see these Bible characters. I don't have Abraham faith. Listen, by the time Abraham displayed the kind of faith we're about to see together, man was, uh, what, 100? Hello? Jesus understands journey. He just says, stay. you struggle, stay in the relate. just stay. Just stay. It's like when you have a course, you know, like you're in a class and just stay in the course. The gospel says, the teacher, Jesus says, I guarantee you're going to have an A if you just stay in the course. I'll tutor you. I got you. You're going to produce that through me, through my, through my help. But just don't leave this class. I promise you it's going to be good. <laughs> That's life with Jesus. Step by step one foot in front of the other, you get there eventually. And that's Abraham's story, and God wanted his son to witness it, to watch the development. Abraham came to understand God's character of love. He could trust Yahweh because he knew the character of Yahweh. He knew the voice of Yahweh. So even when he doesn't understand what's going on and what what is Yahweh asking him and what is he asking me to do? What? What? But I've been on a journey with you. You've been faithful to me. You've never left me in my family. Even when it was hard and I didn't understand, you always came through right on time. Your children need to witness you, parents, worshiping, worshiping, flowing out of your relationship with Jesus every day, that time in prayer and that time in the word, right? And if you're in the word, you want to maybe be reading and meditating, and I encourage journaling through scripture with Christ as the central focus, and then ask the spirit to abide in you that day and just every day and let it flow out of your authentic experience, right? Because then when you call them together, if you're not having an authentic experience with Jesus, they know it and it comes off as inauthentic. And if you're there trying to worship with them, please, I want to strongly encourage you, please don't try to multitask on the phone doing something else. You know why? Because they're going to see that 
as you're not really feeling this. You're not really engaged. You're not all in. This is not that interesting to you. Therefore, it must not be all that interesting for me. Are you hearing this? They need to see us worship them. They need to see you enjoying Jesus. You lifting up holy hands. You praising the Lord. You looking forward to being in the worship experience with the other brothers and sisters in Christ. They need to see you do it. Ah, uh, but there's something else that God wants us to see here in the passage, beginning in verse number six. Are you there? Come on with me now. Verse number six. Here we go. So Abraham took the wood. Oh, Jesus. Mm. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife. And the two of them went together. The two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son, my son. Then he said, Look, the, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Come on, parents, put yourself in Abraham's sandals for a moment. What's your response? Son? And Abraham said, my son God, you can almost hear him choking up. As he, my, my son God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Offering. So the two of them, you heard it, are you hearing it? So the two of them went together. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood, on, wood in order. And he bound, bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And you see and, and, and feel Abraham in this moment, his hand trembling as he gets the wood and places it on his son. And then flash forward to a hill called Golgotha. When the father allows Roman soldiers to place on the lacerated back of my Savior the wood of the cross. And then come back with me now. Come back with me to Abraham. As Abraham's hand is trembling again, Abraham's hand is it's holding the, the fire that is about to consume his son at his hand. And then flash forward with me to Calvary. As the Father sovereignly allows the, the fire of your sin to consume his son. And then flash back now to, to the time now where Abraham is there and he's holding a what? He's holding a knife and his hand is trembling. And this is the moment, is he, I, I guess it's time for me to do this. And then flash forward. When God in tears lets an irreverent Roman soldier pierce the side of his son and blood flows out. There's something happening here in the text. There's something going on here. Did you notice it said they went together? The Godhead is there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, watching what's taking place there. And they're watching this in tears. 
And it says the two went together. You all understand? Isaac, it says lad, maybe in your translation, but that just means he's a young man. He's a young adult. He's probably 20. He's probably got a few ripped muscles, you know, like Pastor C. I mean, you know, he's strong. He's, you know what I'm saying? Holding that wood, you know, he's carrying it. Y'all know my humor by now, right? All right, now, now, now listen. Abraham, I told you, is old now. Isaac could easily, if this was not something, listen, that he wanted to do, could have pushed dad aside and said, well, you're trying to kill me. What? Me, the lamb? What? 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 But no, but what you see, even after he says the Lord will provide, the two of them went together. What you're seeing coming out of the text, Jesus, hallelujah. What you're seeing coming out of the text, man, is father and son have a united resolve to carry this out. Isaac chose to go with his father. See, what, what, whatever was going on with Abraham and his relationship with Yahweh somehow got contagious. And the two of them went together. I'm moved by this because of what it's saying about the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And this brings us to the second thing. Lord, help me. This brings us to the second thing we discover. As parents, we disciple our children into followers of Jesus. When we model faithful submission until it's their own. How many of you like gospel music? Gospel music. How many of you like the ministry of gospel singer Karen Clark? I'll never forget when her first solo album debuted called Finally Karen. And I loved the album so much that I went and got the video, VHS, um, for those of us that are um, (laughs) Gen X and above. It was this... This, this kind of square-like thing that you put into this box, and it showed you stuff on the, the nice big screen, like, you know, from ancient times. So um, I watched it, and um, in it, Karen is talking about her mom, listen, and how her mom influenced her in terms of music and singing, and how she would give her opportunities to exercise her own gift, and, Her mom, how her mom was a model of submitting to the Lord and using your gifts to serve the Lord. And Karen, of course, if you're familiar at all with Karen's music, Karen is known for her high soprano range and riffs and runs that leave you spellbound. And so what Karen does is Karen brings her daughter at the time, a little little girl like my daughter, and Kiera Sheard. You familiar with Kiera Sheard, yes? And so Kiera Sheard gets on stage in the video and Karen starts to sing and does riffs and runs and little Kiera starts to mimic the exact same riffs and runs. And by the time the song is finished, everybody is standing on their feet worshiping the Lord. And when I'm sure that whole song and that whole video was over, people that were present and people that were listening later on, like myself, said, man, we got to watch out for little Kiera. And today, she's one of the top recording gospel artists of our time. And why? Because there were three generations that decided to model faithful submission to the Lord and use their gifts for him. Mom modeled it for Karen Clark. Karen Clark modeled it for Kiera. And we're the beneficiaries of it. The world has been blessed, yes? You see, what, you're ha- what you have here, man, is something that is, is more caught than taught. I want you to hear this. Auntie Ellen says this. I love this, man. She says this in Patriarchs and Prophets, 152. Check it out. She says, talk, commenting on this scene, she says, oh, please hear this. Oh, Lord, help me. Isaac had been trained from childhood to ready, trusting, listen, trusting 
obedience as opposed to legalistic obedience, trusting obedience. And as the purpose of God was opened before him, he yielded a willing submission. He was a sharer, listen, a sharer in Abraham's faith. And he felt that he was, listen, honored in being called to give up his life as an offering to God. He tenderly seeks to lighten the father's grief, speaking of Abraham, and encourages his nerveless hands to bind the cords that confine him to the altar. Did you hear that? Reassuring him to trust in Yahweh because what had happened to him? He had learned to trust in Yahweh. They shared like faith. They had an understanding of the implications and significance of his birth. And they were sharers in the faith together. It wasn't by force. I can imagine they're there saying their last goodbyes. And Abraham, just because he's come to know the character of Yahweh, he is just literally by faith making the statement when we come back together. He is there by faith as he's about to take the, the, the knife with trembling hand, as it says in Hebrews 19, 11. It says that he believed, even though he had never seen it yet, and it never happened in salvation history up until this point, that a resurrection has got to happen. If God's going to fulfill his promise, and he has fulfilled every promise up until that point, including the promise of the birth of his own son. Listen, the parents, look, this, you can't force love to Jesus when it comes to your children. You can't force joining to your kids, joining him in the mission of his church. You, that, that, you can't, you got to model it. It's caught. Woo, look at dad when he praises the Lord. Woo, look how excited mom gets about getting up in the morning so we can worship God together. They shouldn't see you more excited about the new music video from the secular art. They should not see you more excited about the game than you are about Jesus. Because your actions are speaking louder than your words. Discipleship means that you're trying to replicate your experience until it becomes the experience of others. But there's one thing that God needs to be deeply embedded in the minds of your children and in your minds, and it's what he's about to deeply embed in the minds of Abraham and Isaac. And I don't want you to miss this because I just heard somebody a moment ago, I'm, 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 please hear me before I say this, good news. I heard somebody just now say, God help us to be faithful. Are you feeling that way right now? Come on parents, you feeling convicted like Pastor CJ as he's preparing this sermon? There's good news before I close. You know I can't close without good news. Come with me now to verse number 10. And prepare for your shout, yeah? Verse number 10, here we go. And, the, and the Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, capital A in my Bible, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, and listen to the tender way that he says a second time in the, in, the, in the story, here I am. Here I am. Is that, it almost sounds like a friend. Here I am. Intimacy of connection. Here I am. And he said, do not lay, do not, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, only meaning son of the covenant. There's Ishmael, but he's son of the covenant. Your only son of the covenant from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. I can almost see Jesus as he's assuming his, his Old Testament covenant name of angel of the Lord, all of the Godhead, members of the Godhead are in tears, and Jesus is like, oh, but I, can I, I gotta tell him. I gotta tell him. And then Jesus has to say it twice. 
from heaven. He had to say Abraham, Abraham in the Bible, whenever there's that double emphasis, it's weighty, it's strong emotion, it's, it's stop. And why did he have to say it like that? Because Abraham by this point had become so fully committed, so fully submitted, so all in, that he would not stop unless God himself actually shouted at him to stop. Woo, Jesus. And then, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. The ram, my wife said this week, man, what about that ram? I mean, what about his story? I mean, <laughs> he was just walking all in the sea, just all by himself. Oh, man, I'm stuck. Oh, what? What? I'm sorry. Listen, we understand what that ram was signifying, don't we not? There was now a substitute for Isaac. Because lastly, we discover as parents that we disciple our children into followers of Jesus. When we continually establish in their minds, please hear me, a deep trust that God provided a substitute. You establish in their minds that God provided a substitute. Almost every Sabbath school, not Sabbath school, excuse me, children's story uh, I heard growing up was emphasizing obedience, 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 or die. And do we need to obey? Oh, 100%. But we need to understand the biblical orientation to obedience. It's having already received the atoning substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. You see, from Abraham's standpoint, God said it will be provided. From our standpoint, it has been provided. It's done. Historical fact. You said it is finished. That guilt that's weighing you down, what you did maybe even last night, Jesus shouted to you from 2,000 years ago to 2023. It's almost 2024. It is finished. Atonement paid, done. Do you believe it is the question? And if there's anything that needs to be drilled down into your kids' minds, is that obedience flows from grace. Listen, go back and read your Bible, anywhere in the Bible, where God issues a command, understand, it never comes aside from him initiating grace. Period. You find the text and let me know if grace did not take place prior to him issuing the command. You don't work for favor. You work from favor. You don't work for victory. You work from victory. You don't work for assurance. You already have assurance. You don't work for salvation and acceptance and forgiveness. Jesus did it. And when that lodge is in your brain, all that wants to flow from your heart is, man, what, what do you want me to do, God? What did Abraham say? Here I am. Here I am. You stumble along the way. Guess what? He's rushing to get across to your mind again. It is finished. On the Mount of the Lord, Calvary, it was, was provided. It's like Deidre and I, we did some marital counseling, and we can probably have the praise team come up. The, 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 we did some premarital counseling for a couple that was well-to-do some years ago when I first started pastoring, and they were so grateful for the, the experience that uh, they decided at their distance wedding in Puerto Rico, that they would simply pay for our ticket and bring it. I wasn't even officiating the wedding. But they just wanted to just hook us up. Come have an experience. DJ was pregnant with Tommy. They said, look, just take this time. Just enjoy yourselves and come celebrate with us in Puerto Rico. And we were like, oh, the Lord has spoken. And so, and so, <laughs> so we received the free ticket. Are you hearing me? We received that free ticket. But listen, all the effort that we put into packing, all the effort that we put into flying down the highway to get to the airport on time. All of the anxious rushing to the, to the ticket counter would have meant squat if we did not have a ticket. 
we would never have gotten on the plane. No matter all that effort we were dishing out, if we did not have a ticket. That's the gospel. Your obedience flows from grace. Yes. This is Bible-wide. This is not just New Testament. That's what God's been trying to say, man. In Genesis 3, after you and I fell. Every day he just wants to know, do you receive it? I was going to read some passages from Paul, but I'm going to just, I'm going to just skip that. I think you get it. It's by grace. When you talk to your children, don't make them feel like they don't have favor with you because they messed up. You say that does not represent you. I know who you, you're my child. You're still my child. You will always be my child. I just don't like that. And I know that you speak life into those children on their worst moment and make them feel safe to come to you. Well, they won't. Here's the gospel, man. Jesus. Here's the gospel. It's a meme on Facebook, man. You're a child and you just blew it. In legalism in most religions in the world, this is the orientation. Oh, man. Stop. My dad's going to kill me. That's not gospel. Here's gospel. Oh, man. I blew it. I royally messed up. I need to call my dad. 